In this lecture, we continue talking about sexual selection, but focus on intrasexual selection. Intrasexual selection typically refers to male-male competition. This is a type of sexual selection in which traits evolve for contests between males. This can be direct combat, is the most obvious examples of this, in which males will be battling each other for the rights to mate with females. So think of elk, bighorn sheep, elephant, seals, giraffes. Now giraffes, it might surprise you, but recent data has indicated that the real adaptive function of long necks in giraffes is uh, as a sexually selected trait in males, where males will do ritualized battles with each other trying to force submission of, uh, of a rival by beating their necks together. And in a lot of direct combat traits, body size is a key determinant in who is going to win these battles. And this leads to sexual dimorphism in species where males are typically much larger than females because large body size is typically the factor that leads to dominance. And dominance is important. Winners oftentimes monopolize access to females and therefore have much higher fitness. And so there's strong selection pressure to be the dominant, be the biggest, most aggressive individual. And that is seen here with data from baboons, in which in the majority of groups, which is represented on the y-axis here, there's a strong correlation between the male's dominance rank and his ability to monopolize fertile females. So in the vast majority of these groups, the males have 100% or 80% monopolization, and then it drops down from there, but still you can see the bulk of these groups, monopolization is very closely related to dominant rank. There are also indirect contests associated with male-male competition, and this can be as simple as endurance in scramble competition. In European adders, males will travel great distances in, in an attempt to find fertile females, and the males that can travel the longest distance in this scramble competition find more females and mate with more females. Now, females oftentimes mate with more than one male, and that leads to one of the biggest categories of indirect competition, sperm competition. Males may not be able to completely monopolize access to a female, and in that case, multiple matings are going to lead to competition between the male's sperm for which sperm is going to fertilize the eggs. So males can compete in a variety of ways in this realm. They can compete by sperm quantity. Basically, if fertilization is a lottery process, the male that produces more sperm and uses more sperm in copulation with females is going to have a greater chance of fertilizing more of the eggs. In some cases, some sperm may have an advantage over others, perhaps with uh, timing of reproduction. So in some species, there is first sperm advantage. In other species, there's last sperm advantage. And this varies greatly among species. And the exact proximate mechanism associated with first versus last sperm uh, is not always uh, known. Black-winged damselflies take a different approach to sperm competition. As is typical where sperm competition is occurring, females will mate with many males. But in the case of the black-winged damselflies, a male will use the sperm scoops that he has on his penis to remove the sperm from any previous male that has mated with the female. And this has been effective at removing, in laboratory studies, between 90 and 100 percent of any previous male's sperm. And so this is basically a way of eliminating the competition. And here's some scanning electron micrographs showing these uh, phallic structures with the uh, scoops. And in some cases, in other species, there are uh, brushes that are also associated with helping to remove this competitive sperm. Dunnex or hedge sparrows also practice sperm competition. Males spend a lot of their time trying to achieve extra pair copulation with neighboring females. But while they're gone, one of the other neighboring males may have been trying to mate with his female. So what they do is they peck the, their female's cloaca, and that causes her to eject any sperm from a recent mating. Sharks have a similar behavior to the dunnocks and the damselflies, but uh, the mechanism is different. They have a two-tubed penis. One sprays water to basically wash out any competitor's sperm, and then the other one transfers their own sperm. 
Even humans have a mechanism to reduce the competition with competitive sperm. Some sperm morphology is not really set to try to fertilize the egg, but it picks up the chemical signal of rival sperm and will attack and prevent those sperm from swimming successfully to the egg, uh, giving uh, their own sperm that are trying to fertilize an advantage in that regard. And this says something about the nature of the evolution of mating systems in humans. Given that humans have killer sperm, indicates that there has in the past been uh, the need for sperm competition. Also, if you look at the testes size in different great apes, chimpanzees, which have a lot of sperm competition relative to their body size, have really large testicles for production of lots of sperm. Gorillas, on the other hand, the dominant male gorilla basically can monopolize access to the females. And so direct competition is more important there. There's very little sperm competition. So gorillas, despite their large size, have relatively small testes. Humans, on the other hand, are smack dab in the middle in testes size relative to body size, indicating that there is some degree of sperm competition in the history of human cultures. There are other forms of indirect competition that involve preventing males from gaining effective copulations with a female. And if they can't copulate successfully with a female, then there is no need for sperm competition. These take the form of copulatory plugs in some species. So in squirrels, for example, the male's ejaculate will harden inside the female's reproductive tract, making this mucus plug. And the function of this plug uh, is considered by some a copulatory plug, but others have questioned this because what happens sometimes the female will actually pull this mucus plug out and analysis of that plug indicates that it's very rich in proteins and sugars, or carbohydrates, and the female squirrel will eat it. So in that situation, it's unclear if this is truly a copulatory plug where the male is trying to prevent subsequent males from mating with this female, or is it some form of basic nuptial gift? We talked about nuptial gifts earlier. Orb-weaving spiders also produce a copulatory plug by uh, detaching their pedipalp. Their pedipalp is a structure next to their feeding mouth parts, their chelicera, that males use to deliver the sperm packets and males, after they successfully mate with a female, will break off this part of their body again to just reduce the chance that subsequent males are going to be successful. This figure here indicates one of the more bizarre examples of, of the extent that males will go to prevent other males from mating with their previous mate, and they do it by distracting rival males. In this figure here, you can see a female indicating to a male that she is willing to copulate. And she does that by extending her body and extending her antenna in a, in a flat manner. The male is approaching. In this figure, you can see the male copulating. And in this figure, you can see the male finishing copulation. The female is about to walk off. And, and there's a, another male coming onto the scene here. And what happens next is the male that previously mated this female assumes the female mating position to distract the second male who then attempts to mate with the first male as his previously mated female leaves the scene. So again, it's a form of preventing effective copulation from rivals. Other species prevent the competitors from copulating with females through prolonged copulation. If you are mating with a female for a long period of time, then that prevents other males from being able to do so. Mate guarding is also an important way to reduce the competition and prevent even the need for things like sperm competition. That's shown here with dragonflies and fish and lots of birds do this, where the males basically just stay near the female during her most fertile time period to reduce the chance that rival males will be able to mate with her. Here are data showing that mate guarding can be very effective in uh, species, looking in this case at Seychelles warblers. The figure on the left here indicates that during the female's highest fertility period, there are very few intrusions by rival mates and very few extra pair copulation attempts. 
uh, and even fewer successful extra copulation attempts. But if you look at the days prior to her fertile period, there are quite a few intrusions and, and attempts at EPCs. But none of these are successful because this is before the female is fertile. And the reason that these intrusions and EPC attempts are even seen here is because the male is not at this point guarding his female. There's no need in doing so. But as soon as he starts mate guarding, those rates drop considerably. Now the figure on the right shows what happens when the male is tricked into not guarding his female. What they did in this situation is they laid model eggs into the nest of the female, making the male feel like he had missed her fertile period. And then, then during the true fertile period, he had no need to mate guard and he didn't mate guard. And as you can see, during the female's true fertile period, there were quite a few intrusions and extra paracopulation attempts um, and some successful extra paracopulation attempts. So this is just indicating that the females will at attract males, but those males are going to be unsuccessful typically if the male is guarding her at the appropriate time. Now from a male's perspective, there are problems with mate guarding. If you're spending all your time mate guarding, that reduces your time to do things like forage. And it also, from the male's perspective, reduces your potential to seek extra pair copulations of your own. And so this is kind of a condition-dependent situation where the threat of extra pair copulation dictates in large part what your behaviors will be. So in Seychelles warblers, territories that are surrounded by a large number of neighboring males, five and six, spend a lot more time in mate guarding and that mean much less time in foraging behavior. Territories where there was much less threat of extra pair copulations with just three neighbors for example, the male spent considerably less time mate guarding and more time foraging. Let's now talk about conditional mating strategies. Individuals may have to adopt different tactics depending on their circumstances. Subordinate individuals may not be able to effectively compete with dominant individuals, and so these subordinates sometimes adopt what are called alternative mating tactics. These are tactics that have lower reproductive success, but at least it's better than nothing. So in some cases, some people call these making the best of a bad job tactics. So in the case of elephants, for example, large dominant bull elephants are going to be able to, because of their size and aggressive behavior, control a herd of females and prevent access to the, that group uh, through fighting. And subordinate males may not be able to effectively fight and, and gain access to any of these females. So what are some of the subordinate tactics that males could take in these cases? Well, in baboons, their studies have indicated that there are two alternative mating tactics. One, males can form friendships with females. The males in these cases attempt to help to care for and protect the young associated with the female and the dominant male. So he's, he's not caring for his own young, he's caring for the dominant male's offspring. What does he get out of this? Well, the females will occasionally allow some sneaky copulations in her next estrus cycle when males uh, behave this way. An alternative subordinate mating tactic that males may use is forming gangs to attack the dominant males. Each individual may not be able to fight off a male, but as a gang they might be able to fight off these dominant males, at least for a period of time of confusion where some of them can get in a few sneaky copulations with the females. So again, in both cases here, the dominant male is getting more fitness, he is the individual that's able to more or less monopolize the matings. However, the individuals that are not able to compete in this mode are finding alternative ways to get, at least get some fitness. And in many of these circumstances where we talk about these conditional mating tactics, the males that are taking these alternative tactics are basically just biding their time. 
these young male baboons can't fight the dominant male, so they're just waiting until the time where they maybe become more dominant, grow in size, grow in fighting experience, and then they can try these more dominant tactics. Becoming a satellite male is a very important alternative uh, mating tactic, a subordinate tactic used by lots of males and lots of species. In this situation, subordinate males basically just kind of hang out in the area of competing dominant males. They hope to get lucky in moments of confusion when dominant males are fighting among each other. So in uh, frog choruses, Dominant males will be singing, defending individual little territories, trying to attract females. These males may fight each other at certain situations, and if a female comes up at that moment, then the subordinate males can mate with her. Same things happens in uh, bighorn sheep and squirrels, where there are these uh, chases of males, dominant males chasing females to copulate with the female. Sometimes these males end up fighting each other, the female is therefore open to copulation by the subordinate males. And similar things happens in the scramble competition associated with jockeying for position and mating in horseshoe crabs. Another alternative mating tactic that males will use is small males sometimes mimic females in both morphology and behavior. And what this is, this is a tactic to allow them to get close to the females that are already near dominant males without triggering an attack. And at that point, they can then sneak copulations with the females. Rove beetles do this. This is a photograph of amphipods that do this. The major is the dominant male that tries to control access to females. You can see a female here in the bottom left, and above the female is a minor male, and the minor males are those that are mimicking the females. Panorpa scorpion flies actually have three male tactics. The dominant males defend dead insects, which is a resource that attracts females, and the females then mate with the males associated with access to these resources. Medium-sized males adopt a different tactic. They secrete these saliva deposits on leaves, which will also be an alternative resource, food resource for females. Females will eat these, but they're not preferred. The females actually prefer these dead insects. Now, why don't the medium-sized males just go get these uh, insects themselves? Well, dominant males take them away from them. Small males basically are just opportunistic. They grab females that they see walking around trying to get access to either the resources of the medium-sized males or the dominant males. And what these males do is they just hold on to her until she can successfully get away or she just gets tired of fighting in the midst of, of the occasional copulation. And experiments have indicated that males of each size with each tactic do show differences in their fitness. The large males defended crickets and average six copulations, where in the same time period, the medium-sized males averaged only two copulations. And the small males are the third uh, least beneficial reproductive tactic, averaging just one copulation. So medium-sized males and smaller males are ad adopting these um, subordinate strategies, these making the best out of the bad job tactics, but at least they're getting some fitness. And interesting in this experiment, what they did is at one point they removed the large males and showed that this truly was a conditional dependent choice of, of strategies or tactics to use. The medium and the small males shifted up to uh, the tactics once the large males were removed. The medium males uh, took over the cricket insects and the small males shifted up to guarding the saliva secretions that were produced by the medium-sized males. Well, now let's move on to talk about distinct mating strategies that represent what we call evolutionary stable strategies, or ESSs. These are different strategies or tactics, different behaviors that have equal fitness. This is how they differ from the conditional dependent strategies talked about previously. These are strategies that are heritable. Different males will do different things, and they have different genetics associated with each of the behavioral tactics that they assume. Classic example of this is in some marine isopods. These individuals live in sponges, 
and the alpha males are large and they use more dominant male-male competition tactics to try to restrict access to females. Well, beta males are medium size and about the same size and um, behavior as females. They mimic females so that they can try to get past the alpha males, get close to females, and mate with them. Gamma males are exceedingly small and what they try to do is sneak around. They basically just sneak into the territories of alpha males when there are females there and mate with them before they're seen and sneak out. It turns out that each of these strategies is heritable so gamma males are, are likely to produce gamma males, beta males produce beta males, and alpha males produce alpha males. What differs in this situation from the conditional dependent strategies seen previously, not only that the, the genetics of these individuals is fixed, but that all of them have comparable fitness. They're just, there's, this is basically, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Uh, all of them are having comparable fitness. These same basic strategies are also seen in bluegill sunfish where some males are big and dominant and defend nests in which they attract females to lay the eggs into those nests. Smaller males basically mimic females and approach uh, the nests of males while a female is laying her eggs into those nests and then they shed sperm uh, on these secretly while the male thinks that it's a, another female laying eggs. And then there are very small sneaker males that will just swim in really quickly, shed sperm over uh, a nest when the female is laying eggs, and then swim out of the way before they can be attacked by the alpha males. And again, in bluegill sunfish it's been shown that each of these different strategies used by males have comparable fitness, and there's a genetic basis associated with the morphology and the behavior of each of the males. So it's not like the sneaker males are doing this just until they can get bigger uh, and then they'll adopt one of the other strategies. They're born to do uh, one or the other. So in this section we talked about intrasexual selection which in most cases involves male-male competition. And there's strong selection pressure on males to control the number of fertilizations. Remember, the key determinant in male fitness is quantity. The more gametes fertilized by their sperm, the higher their fitness will be. Quality is not typically the issue, it's quantity. Males can compete directly uh, to try to limit the access of other males to females to try to, to sequester a harem or a group of females that only they mate with. And so this leads to the evolution of combat traits and body size where males tend to be much larger than females. But there can also be situations of indirect competition. If males can't successfully monopolize access to females, and females are mating with multiple males, then males basically are still competing, but they're doing so indirectly. This can involve scramble competition for finding more females. So this selects for greater travel ability. So males are still competing, but again, they're competing more indirectly. But one of the biggest categories of indirect competition is sperm competition where males that produce the larger testes and sperm quantity may have an advantage or there may be selection for timing of insemination so in some cases making sure you're the first or competition to be the last to mate with a female. Some males remove the sperm of rival males before they insert their own. Some species have sperm of different morphologies, some of which are attack sperm that will chemically detect intruder sperm and attack those sperm. Indirect competition can also involve males trying to reduce the successful matings of other males with the female which you have mated with by the production of copulatory plugs or guarding the female or having prolonged copulation with the females. So again, this is different from the direct competition we talked about previously in which males are trying to monopolize the access to a bunch of females. This is typically a one-on-one -on -one situation. We talked about conditional mating strategies and how subordinate individuals will adopt alternative strategies associated with lower fitness, but at least they're just trying to get some fitness, uh, making the best of a bad job. And these org individuals are typically waiting until they have better options available. So they may be young, small, and they're waiting to become older and more dominant. 
these alternative uh, strategies or tactics can involve being satellite males or sneaker males, mimicking females, or forming gangs of subordinates to overwhelm dominant individuals. We also talked about distinct mating strategies, strategies that have the same or comparable fitness and are genetically controlled evolutionary stable strategies, meaning there is heritable variation among the variable strategies. There are different genes for different behavioral traits, and each of them has comparable fitness, and that's why they're what we call evolutionarily stable strategies. They can coexist in the population at the same fitness level.